Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 27 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. For many of us, the path to our interest in medieval history began in historical fiction or fantasy novels, and for a good number of the people listening today, that love for the past was sparked by a novel by Guy Gabriel Kay. Guy is the author of 14 novels that range from high fantasy to reality with a twist, most of which are based in a version of the Middle Ages. His works include Tigana, The Lions of al Rasan, the award-winning Isabel, and Children of Earth and Sky. His work has become so well-known and well-loved that in 2014, Guy was named to the Order of Canada. So when I heard that he had a new novel coming out, I thought it was the perfect time to bring him on the podcast. I caught up with Guy in the heart of downtown Toronto to speak with him about his latest novel, A Brightness, long ago. Here's our conversation about the new book, why he loves Renaissance Italy, and why he enjoys being a moving target. So thanks for joining me. It's great to have you on the podcast. I'm really excited to be talking about the new book. It's nice to be here, Danielle. So the new book that you've just written is called A Brightness Long Ago, and it takes place not in the the world as we know it, but in a similar world that is like Renaissance Italy, right? Yeah. I've been uh, accused more or less, although generally kindly accused, of having invented a form which is to say a merger of the fantastic and history with a tilt towards the historical aspect of it. Uh, Somebody once said that I write history with a quarter turn to the fantastic, and I'm comfortable with that description. So this is not 15th century Italy, but it is very much grounded in evoking that time and place. And you've been you've worked in in this sort of 15th century Italy before. So what brought you back to that for this book? I'm not sure. I think in terms of what brings me back, I think that I would frame it in my own mind more as what's not to love about this time and place. And when I wrote Children of Earth and Sky, which was my previous novel, It was covering something of the same ground, but most of it further east towards what we would call the Balkans and then into Istanbul, Constantinople. Uh, This one was specifically inspired by reading about the feud between two brilliant condottieri, military warlords, who absolutely loathed each other. And this is... uh, Sigismund Malatesta and Federico Montefeltro. And that hatred was an anomaly of sorts because one of the things you learn about warfare in the Renaissance in Italy is that the war leaders took great pains not to fight. (laughs) When you fought, People died, horses died, expenses went up, and your whole game was economic. You were a fighter for hire with your armies that you paid for, and when people got killed, it was bad for the economic aspect of your business. So they worked very hard not to actually fight. In fact, the next spring, when the war season resumed, you might be fighting on the other side of a conflict with the person you were arraigned against the year before. So this particular personal intensity of dislike, if you will, which usually meant they were almost always, if not always, on opposite sides of conflict, fascinated me as one starting point for for this novel. Yeah, you definitely see this enmity between these two mercenary captains, and they are, they are more than that. They're very, very powerful, and it kind of drives the story, but it's interesting in that you don't actually have them as narrators in any sense. They are kind of peripheral figures, but the, the plot very much moves around them. So, so why did you decide to work kind of around them instead of directly setting it in the voice of one of these mercenaries? It's a good question, and there's no... Always be suspicious when an author tells you after the fact exactly why he or she did something. It could be made to sound eminently rational and lucid and worked out when in fact a lot of it is instinct 
after, in your 14th novel in my case, there's a certain amount of instinctive awareness of what might suit best to tell a story. In this case, one of the themes of the novel has to do with memory and recollection and looking back. And the principal narrator is a man in middle age at the time he's telling us the story, 25 years later, but he was a very young man just entering, if you will, the theater of the world at the time the bulk of the narrative takes place. And I wanted to write a book where someone thinks about why do we remember some things? Why are some people, some moments, so vivid in our recollection and others that might have been as important in the way our lives played out don't hold that incandescent brightness for us. So that was one of the themes and that required that narrator from the outside remembering not only these two men but two women that he encountered in that same time frame 20 years before. And that outside viewpoint is also really useful, I've always found, for letting a reader share the sense of learning about the people that the novel is anchored by. If a character in the book is learning about these situations, the reader comes in through the viewpoint of that character, and there's a fusion, there's a harmony between the character's discovery and the reader's discovery. And I like that. I liked, um, as an English major, um, how subtly you come across some of these details. And you don't make a big deal of things like, so the main character is Danio, and uh, you don't make a big deal of how he ends up getting to the positions that he's in because he kind of some stumbles through circumstance into you know major plot points and this happens in part because of his education and so for you know as a medievalist you see these little details like having an education gets you a little bit further in ways that are not necessarily linear and these sort of subtle ways at getting at these actual events in history where things could happen in weird circumstances because even if you're born poor, for example, you might have some opportunities. So why did you pick somebody who was sort of a, a tailor's son um, who kind of makes good by accident? What, what spoke to you about that? Well, we're back to my caveat about don't believe a word I say after the book is done. I've been interested for the last several books in trying to do what, as a historian, you will know, became a strong new vein in historical research in the 50s and 60s, starting in France principally with the Annales group, where they started to try to find ways to tell the stories of people whose stories tended not to be told. Uh, this would, for example, obviously be the stories of women, trying to find those in the written records, or if they weren't in the written records, looking for them in unusual, unexpected places, like records of births and deaths in a, in a parish, uh, what names were common in a given part of France at a given time, and then working out why. That became a fascination for me early in my own writing about history. So if I'm using a figure who begins from relatively modest beginnings, that dovetails with that interest. I'll add something. And this is where I love research. My favorite part of writing is the research because I'm just learning things. I don't have responsibilities to do anything with it yet. Tailors in Renaissance Italy were relatively higher on the social scale than most other craftspeople because, and if you think about it, you'll get this, tailors went into the homes of the aristocrats and the wealthy. They went into the chambers of the men and women they were dressing and fitting clothing for. They were confided in by these men and women. And so they had, by virtue of being invited into the home, that not exalted status, that would be a silly thing to say, but an enhanced status. And that, when I discovered that, that was a penny dropped, if you will, as to what I would make my protagonists father, 
because he meets the father, meets enough men of influence in his trade that the fact that he has a bright, promising lad for a son can go through the ripple effect of accident where someone with influence recommends Guadagno be sent to a school. And by the way, that school was modeled on, modeled on historical reality as well, where they did admit some children of artisans and craftspeople, not just the children of the aristocrats. It comes together if you take enough time to let a book just state for me. Yeah, and it, it is reminiscent of history where it's it's all about who you know and accident and that, that's how things happen. And so I thought that was nice in the story. It wasn't it didn't feel forced, which I really quite liked. But let's get to the women for a second because there are several powerful women in this. And uh, Adria is probably the the main woman in this and she gets to have a little bit more agency and this is permitted by her family which I really kind of appreciated because I think there are a lot more women on the margins of what we say uh, women were allowed to do than than most history books would say so what made you pull this this woman character again like I'm asking you what made you do this but what's interesting to you about Adria as a character we could go for the entire length of the podcast talking about this one I'll start by saying what I don't do. I don't write about strong women and their agency for political reasons. I don't actually like fiction as a reader where I feel that the author is superimposing their political views of any kind of politics on the, on the narrative. What I do want to do is keep you up till three in the morning and have you engaged emotionally as well as intellectually by the story. And I have a better chance of doing that if you are compelled by, taken with, more characters. And that will mean, for me, that the female character as well as the male get that agency, suspense, interest, wit, significance. I've got a better chance of holding the reader in my own mind when I do that. I'm also very aware of trying not to do something else I dislike, which is put 21st century people in 15th century clothing. That, by the way, is a commercially very successful formula in today's historical fiction, and I don't want to do that. I will push the envelope a bit which takes us back to Audrey or Adria, the envelope pushing is that there's no formal template for that character that my research gave me. What my research gave me was a significant number of very strong, intelligent, capable, in some cases militarily capable of resisting sieges, women in the 15th century in Italy. I took my inspiration from the strength of these historically important women to create one who gets to agency by her own path. This again kind of spoke to me about that marginal type of woman from the actual Middle Ages where her family was kind of supportive in her not wanting to immediately marry or or do other things and they they allowed her kind of some space to, to be a bit more free than, again, like history textbooks might tell you. But there's a timeline on it. In the book, the timeline is that her father, who indulges her, and her uncle, who abets her in seeking this independence and agency, and her aunt, in fact, are both all aware that, all right, this will come to an end. Your natural course will resume. You will end up in an advantageous dynastic marriage or taking a position of power and influence in a convent. And those were, in fact, the two paths available to a woman like Atria Ripoli in this novel. What I've done with the book is allow a delay, if you will, not a subverting, not a denial, but a delay in the space 
in which this novel plays out. And talking about not putting a 21st century person in a 15th century outfit, um, she accepts that. She accepts that this is a there's a time limit on this, and then that's going to be her path, and she accepts it and prepares for that, which it makes a lot of sense to me in terms of the context. There's another woman in the novel, another significant woman, the healer, Yelena, who is not from any kind of family of power and significance. She also pursues her own course as a healer and takes, if you will, if you think about it, more risks than Adria does because she has no one backing her up. She is going towards independence and freedom and pursuing her vocation, in fact, as someone who wants to practice medicine, natural medicine. That's all it was in those days, really. And she's, to my mind, you can argue, braver even because of the absence of any kind of backup. She's out in the world utterly on her own, except with various lovers or partners she chooses at different times. Adria has that backing of her family that allow her to do this. And I wanted that to be something that resonated in the book. I hope it does, because the existence of support all through history as a part of human nature. If you want to be an artist instead of a doctor and your parents back you in that, that affects your ability to go ahead and pursue that. Yeah, I like the contrast between Adria and Yelena because they do come from very, very different um, backgrounds in, in terms of their agency, again, and the decisions that they have to make. And Yelena is an interesting one. I would think that you could have more space to play with her because she's a very marginal person in the way that a healer would have been a very marginal person at the time, especially one that's pagan. It's not following the, the major religion at the time. It's Again, it's, it's not quite history, so it's not quite Christianity, for example. That's the major religion here. But Yelena's she's working on the outside. She's living on the outside. And she has a lot of times where she has to consider what her next options are going to be and what is safe, which I thought was was um, a good thing to consider. So when you're, when you're looking at Yelena, did you find you had a bit more creative room with her? You've used an interesting phrase there. When we talk about safety, one of the things I try to tease out in, in many of my novels is the degree to which people's decisions, a cities, a persons, a families, turn on that very raw issue of survival. This, for example, is what allowed some of the vicious heads of state, these minor lordlings of small towns, to get away with such savage, untrammeled behavior at times. Why? Because they were strong enough in military terms to keep the city safe from conquest. If you lived in a city in a time when they were constantly being raided and besieged and changing hands in a violent conflict. Remember, we talked before about soldiers didn't tend to get killed that much, but people did. Farmers, villagers, they died in these conflicts, often of starvation or disease as the consequences of warfare. So if you were a military leader with a force formidable enough to stave off this fate, people might ruefully shrug and say, as I put it once, he's a savage beast, but he's our savage beast. And so that issue of safety and survival was so dominant, so powerful, and still is in much of the world, still is, that I wanted to, and I have in several books, try to bring it more to the foreground for modern readers to try to take on board an awareness of this, not so much as a difference from today, but as something that needs highlighting about the world of uh, medieval times or the Renaissance. Yeah, people have to make practical decisions based on what what the odds are at the time for survival. And you see a lot of that in the book because, as we said, the, 
the the major conflict between these two um, mercenaries is uh, is what it, what it works around and there's always kind of this looming danger and that really has an effect on the decisions that the people make and I think that's very sympathetic to to the actual Renaissance Italy and the Italians that were living at that time I think that's it, it's good to have that kind of sensitivity to that <laughs> do you think that you'll come back to Renaissance Italy I keep being asked this right now and you're asking me this in a very dangerous time to ask me that question because Danielle I never know what the next book will be when I finish them. And I hate it. I am a miserable human being right at this moment. If I appear affable and charming, it's because I've learned how to fake it. Truth. You're telling me this now? <laughs> right at the end, right? But the truth is, there is an inexhaustible wealth of stories and themes, motifs to explore in so many times and places. Renaissance Italy, the Renaissance in a wider sense, is fabulously engaging for a historian or for a novelist with a passion for history and a life's exploration of it. So of course I can come back to the Renaissance, but I could also end up writing a book of seafood recipes at this point. So. Well, you said that the pleasure is in the research. I think that would be really great research, right? Okay, so we're talking a little bit about inspiration and, and where these things come from and where you go back to. So I have to bring up the Silmarillion. How, how did you end up working on that? Because I don't think people re really know about that. So you helped Christopher Tolkien work on the Silmarillion. So how did that come about? It's actually the single most common question that comes up in interviews over all these years. But Christopher Tolkien was named as his father's literary executor in J.R.R. Tolkien's will. When that happened, he took on the main responsibility that he had then was to bring the Silmarillion into print. He knew he needed help. He did not want, for a wide variety of personal reasons, another 50-year-old academic working with him on the book. That got into complex psychodynamics. I knew him because his second wife's father was a Canadian, his second wife was Canadian, and her father was a surgical colleague of my dad. And so a couple of years before, when they were visiting her parents in Winnipeg, where I grew up, I was already well known as a Tolkien fan. I was doing my undergraduate, finished my undergraduate at the University of Manitoba. We were introduced, Christopher and I, and my joke line, which is also a truth, is we got on about as well as an Oxford Dawn and a Canadian undergraduate are going to get on. And when his father passed away a couple of years later, and he took on this responsibility, he had it thrust upon him, Christopher saw the editing process in the inception as a classic academic exercise. And as an academic yourself, you'll know that the template for so much work is a senior professor working with bright, hyper-energetic graduate students who will do 18-hour days in getting a book or a project untracked. And in his mind, because it was going to be a scholarly book and the families knew each other, and he could trust me with his father's letters and journals and notes. It fit his conception of the project. So he invited me to come over to Oxford to work on the Silmarillion. The irony in the story, for those who've read the Silmarillion, is that it's not a scholarly book. It ended up being a novel, essentially, an unusual sort of novel, but a novel. And that is probably the single largest structural contribution I made, which was to urge him, persuade him, to explore whether we could do the book on that basis rather than along the lines of what every book he did subsequently, which was an academics exercise in text, annotation, commentary, index, footnote, the Silmarillion is not that kind of book. And I was thinking of it because I was wondering if, you know, as a young, uh, a young student, a young budding novelist, that working with this material, if that gave you some sort of courage to start to write in a world that is vaguely medieval, 
but uh, but with a quarter turn. Did that help you not just give you inspiration, but give you a little bit of courage to take that leap? I don't think so one to one, Danielle, because the Tolkienic inspiration, as it were, which was very real, took a number of forms, but I don't think that was it. For one thing, the first trilogy I wrote was a traditional high fantasy, superimposing at that time 20th century characters and adult sexuality and some themes of myth and legend, including Freud's interpretation of myth and legend. So I wrote a Tolkienic style fantasy with my first three books in the 1980s. So the influence there is acknowledged and obvious. The historical work emerged some years later when I decided that I wasn't going to write what I called then a four-volume trilogy (laughs) that I didn't believe in. We now get nine-volume trilogies, but at that time, my joke I thought was very clever. When you're young, you think all your jokes are clever. (laughs) And it was when I moved to write to Ghana in the late 1980s, published in 1990. That was my breakthrough book in global terms. And to Ghana was a fusion of a fantasy setting, something that back then was inspired by 15th century Italy in the sense of how the internecine squabbling between the city-states not only didn't cause them to resist France and Spain coming in, but they took turns inviting them in. That was one of the inspirations. But another was the Prague Spring and the Czech Republic, the exercise of what conquerors do to subjugated people, how they take away their history, their names, their language, their artwork. That was the time when I began to think about working much more closely with motifs from history that crossed more than one time and place. So I don't think the Silmarillion can fairly be taxed with the path I've ended up taking. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, So I have to ask, you've played in the Middle Ages in different cultures, which I think is really interesting, uh, kind of a global Middle Ages when it comes to your books. So what speaks to you about the Middle Ages? Because you could have gone with all of history, the ancient world, you know, a more modern world, a steampunk world. So what is it that speaks to you about the Middle Ages? It's hard to pin down what shaped you young. I was very young when the Arthurian saga imprinted itself upon me as something that fascinated me. I read a historical fiction set in uh, late antiquity in the early Middle Ages. People were like, oh God, I loved Mary Reynolds' books about ancient Greece. I loved Rosemary Sutcliffe's books about England after the fall of Rome. These things had an impact upon what drew me as a reader. And I've often said that most novelists I know write the books they'd like to read if somebody else wrote them. So that interest was very early. Having said that, I've also ranged a field. I've tried to not narrow myself too specifically. Uh, There's two novels inspired by Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty China. There's a book set in Provence in the present day. I have attempted to be, and it's not a commercially smart thing to do, but I've attempted to be a moving target and not lock in on one time and place. And you look back over 14 books, and one of the great pleasures, Danielle, for me, is that if you bring in 25 or 30 readers into where we're sitting now and ask them, what's your favorite K book? The odds are good that most of them will be named by someone as their favorite. That moving around, I feel, is something I have, I mean this literally, I got away with it. (laughs) It's a counterintuitive strategy for someone writing fiction and hoping to only write fiction. And it's a debt of gratitude I owe to my readers over 35 years now across many countries and languages that I've been able to do that. 
Well, I'm really, I'm really glad that you've been playing in the Middle Ages because I have to say, A Brightness Long Ago is my first book that I've read by you. It won't be the last, though. Um, thank you so much for writing this, and thanks for being on the podcast and being a lovely human being, even though you're between books. <laughs> thanks for being on. You're very welcome. It was good chatting with you. A Brightness Long Ago is available everywhere you find awesome novels, and you can keep up with Guy Gabriel K by checking out his website, brightweavings.com or by following him on Twitter, at Guy Gabriel K. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey, Danielle. Yeah, we, uh, we're back in business with the website. We had a little trouble the uh, previous week uh, po- getting some posts in, but fortunately that's all, all been fixed, and it's now allowed us to catch up, and so we, we had a lot of good pieces from our writers that came in, and I'll, I'll just kind of go through them. Uh, you can read about 10th century Byzantine strategy. You can read about King Arthur and werewolves. You can read about St. Augustine in Renaissance Italy. And finally, some interesting reasons why you wouldn't want to become a priest in the Middle Ages. So uh, all that and more on Medievalist.net this week. Thanks, Peter. At the moment, I'm busily working on a new article for Medieval Warfare magazine. Not a subscriber yet? How about visiting the Medievalist.net Patreon page? You can grab yourself a digital or paper subscription to Medieval Warfare and support the podcast at the same time. Now that's a sweet deal. Check out patreon.com slash medievalists. For all sorts of news and articles about the Middle Ages, you can follow Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can also follow me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. After you add a brightness long ago to your Amazon cart, you can find yourself a copy of my books there too, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, which is now available for pre-order. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks, as always, for tuning in every week. Have yourself a wonderful day.